Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm delighted to say uh, good afternoon to you in the UK, but because we have about six different time zones ascending, I want to say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. Thank you for staying up, and thank you for getting up very, very early to join us. We have a, a wonderful discussion to take place today. The subject in conjunction with Tech UK and with Open Banking Implementation Entity is financial inclusion. And before I introduce you to our panel, I'd like to set the scene as why this discussion is so relevant right now. Um, the subject is open banking and financial inclusion. And people bandy around open banking and use the name and lots of technical descriptions for it. But I want to give you a, a quick 60 second synopsis of why it matters now. Since the history of time when banking began, your method of engaging with your bank was prescribed by them. You had to use the channel the bank gave you, their branch, their telephone, their internet channel in the recent years. Only if you were a big corporate could you get really, really big, fast access as well. That changes. Open banking changes the way that we can access our bank. So a lot of the legacy challenges that we face within inclusion and we face within social banking and we face within our day-to-day -day banking have been removed. What we can finally do now is get information quickly, efficiently, and easily. Everything comes with consent. It's a word you'll hear a lot. The crucial phrase I give to, to describe exactly what that is, we can now get the bank we want, not the one we are given. It's the same bank, but we can access it in a different way. So what are we going to do today to talk about? We're going to try and expose the areas where open banking can help where it changes some of those challenges, some of the constrictions, some of the narrow points in the pipeline as well. To do that, we would need to have uh, some very, very strong experts. In many panels, you will see people come from big brand names, um, maybe not experts in that field. They will come from certain areas who have industry experience in certain things. Well, well, not, not this panel. In this panel, I personally think you have some of the greatest experts in inclusion, uh, within the United Kingdom, certainly. We have people that come from the social banking arena, from the credit union arena, from vulnerability, from enormous credit bureaus as well that have that exposure and people that have actually managed these real accounts. So without any further ado, uh, I would like to introduce, let the panel introduce themselves first of all. So um, if I look in front of me, Rob, over to you. And, and welcome everybody, wherever you may be. Um, I'm Rob Haslingdon, so I'm head of digital proposition for experience here in the UK, working primarily within the consumer credit and business information side of the business. Um, I've been involved on behalf of the business with open banking really since its inception, so um, regarded as a bit of a subject matter expert within Experian. Um, and I just want to be transparent with the audience. We are openly advocates of uh, open banking. Um, experience invested quite heavily in open banking, certainly in the UK, but also globally. And we have services which are operational in the market as well. So I'm here really whilst representing Experian, but also as a fan of open banking. So open acknowledgement of that. And the most recent product, which I think is highly pertinent in the context of this market that we've launched, is our School Boost product, which actually enables consumers to boost their credit score using open banking, which you know, is there to actually promote financial inclusion. So it's a very pertinent conversation for us. So welcome, everybody. Carolyn, over to you. So I'm Carolyn Delahanty. I'm Vulnerable Customer Experience Coach. Uh, 20 years ago, I was financially vulnerable. I was uh, made to make the decision between putting five pounds of petrol in my car versus five pounds of food on my table. And one meant I could get to work and one meant I would co continue living. So fast forward 10 years and I land up at E.ON, the energy company, where I worked for 13 years in their uh, the customer experience team and I grew it from uh, a blank page. We started with nothing and we were the first of the customer experience roles there and I've done every role in that, including measurements, customer journey mapping, um, vulnerable customer experience as well. And I took the opportunity in 2018 to take voluntary redundancy and that's been a great thing for me since because I now get to help all sorts of regulated organisations improve their vulnerable customer experiences and I bring my lived experience to bear in doing so. Dave. My name is Dave Lockwood. I work for Finders International and we're a probate genealogy company. And you're wondering what the hell is a probate genealogy company doing on this webinar? Well, I have to say I have no banking experience whatsoever. I know nothing about banking. But what I do know about is vulnerable adults and capacity issues. Because prior life, I used to work for a local authority or several local authorities where I acted as deputy decision maker under the Court of Protection, managing people's finances. So have experience of banking and finances and, and looking at open banking and what it can do with vulnerable people, how it can assist them. But 
also the things that could be barriers to open banking with capacity. So there you go. Adrian. My name is Adrian Davis. I'm the co-founder at Nestec. We provide decisioning software using credit bureau data and open banking data for responsible lenders, especially credit unions. Um, we um, hit a milestone today, um, having decisioned 100 million pounds worth of loans, 80% uh, of which come from the areas of the highest income deprivation, top 20% most income deprived places in the country, and we've got a lot of data behind that as well. Um, so I started my career back in the 1990s as a money advisor um, and then went on to uh, set up, manage and consult for several credit unions over the past uh, 20 years or so. Um, we set Nest Egg up in 2017 and we've been using open banking since February 2018. Um, and we use those two sets of data, credit bureau data and open banking data, um, to make it really easy for people to apply and get accepted um, for affordable loans, um, mainly from uh, credit unions. And last but not least, Lucky. I've been with the credit union for the last 25 years. Um, London Mutual Credit Union, which has about 35,000 members. Out of that, uh, 20,000 of them are financially excluded members, so either part-time employees or, or unemployed members. So we, we work with them uh, providing holistic financial services for uh, those members. So I hope you'll agree with me when you've heard the panel that we have some very real empirical experience here and we have people that uh, are very much involved in the practice of where we are as well. And it, and it leads us to make quite a sweeping statement, which is there is no magic wand for vulnerable financial behaviour. There are iterations. There is no one policy that can change everything. But what's really important is we understand what those problems are, first of all. So if we set that scene, if we say that financial inclusion covers a great deal of problems that a lot of people have, what are the big areas that we should focus on in open banking? What are the what are those key elements that we should look at to address first? So if we prioritize the challenges within um, financial inclusion, Carolyn, if I could offer that to you to say what you think about that, what's the big key areas you'd drag out? So it's, it's a great question because I think but when people think of vulnerability, people think of what they can see and not what we don't know about people. So vulnerability is, and in many ways over the last 18 months, we've all become vulnerable because, because of the unpredictable nature of life at the moment so you know we need to just bear in mind that vulnerability and vulnerable is a great big topic so in terms of the key issues I think the most the most prevalent one at the moment is uh, financial um, vulnerability in particular things like uh, financial domestic abuse and domestic abuse in it with, without the financial element um, I was listening to somebody talking this morning um, just about a, a, a customer who um, their, their um, kitchens, kitchen cupboards were locked and they thought that was normal and they, they were unlocked when their partner came home. And that sort of vulnerability that they weren't aware of, they weren't aware they were vulnerable. And we we spot things like that in, in um, as energy companies, as banking companies, as financial services Um we can listen out for things like that and, and help customers and give them a way out, which I think is very, very topical in the in the pandemic where not all not all avenues are still open. Adrian, would you like to have some thoughts? I think it's probably worth worth starting, Simon, with with the whole question. The, the big issue is um, for people who can't access open banking. So the unbanked. So you've got to catch 22. I don't have a bank account. I can't use open banking. Therefore, I can't use open banking to help me get a bank account. And so people get stuck in this catch 22 position. And so I think, you know, I don't have an immediate solution for this, but I think there's a lot of really good work going on. Whereas if we provide our identity and our credit position, our open banking data, whatever that might be to one entity, can we somehow find a way to make that portable so it can be shared with another entity so someone doesn't have to go through the whole process mm -hmm. of identifying themselves again mm -hmm. even that lender may only have a certain set of data to rely on so i think there there is this inevitable question about one of the biggest outcomes of financial exclusion is that you're unbanked and if we're using open banking to get people ex in included we need to find an easier way to get people access to those accounts that then can use and contribute to open banking Lucky, um, can I hand over to you, uh, you from the views of your customer base as well? What would you say are the biggest items that we've got to address within uh, financial inclusion? 
I mean, I would say a number of things that we need to address, but I'm looking at in a different uh, point of view. Open banking, uh, how do we help the, the financially excluded? But if we first, as an organization, help ourselves, uh, that means enabling the technology available for us right now, that will free up a lot of our time so that we can process a lot of loan applications. For example, um, we are using uh, the open banking, the bank account uh, statements that we are getting digitally now. Um, so compare that with uh, one of our loan officers going through pages and pages of bank statements. Um, they need to categorize them and then sometimes they miss some transactions. So we, miss, we might miss some gambling uh, uh, had addictions in there. So what we are looking at is that how we help ourselves first and then uh, the other part will come naturally. So right now what's happening uh, as a result of that implementation, 40% um, of our loan applications are coming with open banking uh, bank statements. And now our decision making process is quicker. That means we can process um, lots of applications. So th that's how I'm looking at. So that will also benefit, of course, the financially excluded members. What you're saying is, is that actually the efficiencies in the process delivered by open banking as well as the benefits to end user are huge. It's a great answer. I mean, I think um, I touch upon a point that Adrian made earlier on. I think it, it, part of it's around helping people understand the value of their data. And I think one of the items that was quite fascinating that's come out of COVID is that by virtue of us basically not going out and about and doing what we do in our normal lives, you know, spending and shopping, we've managed to see what the impact of COVID would have in terms of our ability to, to save our money and put our money elsewhere. So I think that's quite important. So the idea of having a better understanding of your data and then how you use that for good, as well as understanding more about how you can proactively manage your money, I think is really important. I mean, the key topics that keep on coming back to the surface with open banking and their, their primary use cases around eligibility. So using the data proactively to con con confirm someone's eligibility for a product or service or to get access to a better value product or service, which helps improve their money management and then affordability. And one of the things that we found by analyzing transactional data with banks is the kind of a number of themes that have come up to light through the, through COVID that actually open banking is helping to expose. So firstly around financial resilience. So people have made perhaps no contribution to savings or pension part of the last year. That makes them exposed and therefore, you know, more vulnerable. Over indebtedness. So using, um, you know, an, a loan on a higher value credit product to actually fund the basic um, needs of life, essentials of life. And then the impact of um, income shock furlough redundancy and the analysis of bank transaction data and automated analysis, which Lucky just touched upon, enables us to reveal all of this and actually proactively use that information to support customers and understand more about their vulnerabilities in a positive way to help them. So I think that's really important. And Dave, over to you, I suppose, the, 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 I have a slightly twist on that question as well with you. We talk about financial inclusion for the living and yeah. for people who maybe have capacity as well. I imagine you've got quite a different view on those that have sadly passed away as well and the challenges that are faced in the banking regime. So expand away. Challenges for people that have passed away, um, especially when somebody's bank accounts and, and everything is now virtual, it's online, it's, it's, it's tucked away and there's no paperwork these days. So how do we access those details how do we know that those details are there is there a register that somebody can go to sadly i don't think there is so the issue for for certainly from a probate point of view from what we're looking at is knowing what there is out there trying to find what's out there and, and pulling things together there are one or two you know things that are coming through you know, that you can identify through um i think one one thing i'll call is settled i don't know if you've heard of that but it's a uh, an organization that you can contact and they will then contact i presume through open banking everybody that's supplying that person with electricity energy whatever their banking and that pulls it all into one so for that that's a really big leap forward that we can then go to them and say what have they got and that information's pulled in for you 
Um, the other issue as well I come from as well is a capacity issue. So somebody has lost capacity. So if they've made a decision to use something through open banking, how do we know that we've made that, they've made that decision? How do we find that out? So those are the challenges that are there. And especially with traditional banking and different rules and everything, every different bank having a different rule for how you deal with probate, a lasting power of attorney, a court protection order. Those are the, you know, those are the, the, the key points for me, let's say. What you've probably just heard there across the board is, is that the range of problems we face are very diverse. So we've got people with capacity issues, people with assessment issues. We've got people who have passed away when we go into probate. Probate accounts at banks, as a man that used to run 110,000 of them, they are an enormous challenge as well. Then you hear from a credit union from Lucky about how the efficiencies of the back office can actually help the consumer in the front office. This is a wide subject. So we've got to specialise. We've got to uh, pick with bits we want to win. This goes back to the point of everything assessment is a huge subject assessment can be used for lending it can be used for uh, it can be used for borrowing it can be used for cash flow it all boils back down to that when we look at assessment what can we look at for the benefits of it and i'm going to put that to adrian first of all if our way what can we draw from open banking for assessment adrian i think you know and I've, i think we've all seen open banking put forward as a really um, helpful um, tool for people with thin credit profiles um, but I think probably before thinking about what, what, could, what, how does that help, we also need to understand that from our experience, certainly people generally don't have thin credit profiles. They have a thin credit profile because it's resting with one credit bureau and then some other stuff with another credit bureau and another stuff with another credit bureau. So actually one of the problems open banking is trying to solve is also an issue for silo data between the different credit bureau. So that's something I think needs addressing at the same time. But un undoubtedly open banking helps um, plug those gaps um, for people and lenders that are only using one credit bureau. The other thing I would add is taking it away from the individual credit assessment and thinking about portfolio risk. So the FCA has a concept around credit worthiness, which is made up of credit risk, which you might traditionally think of as being attached to your credit score and affordability. Those two things make up um, uh, credit worthiness. And so traditionally, lenders will look at their loan portfolio by credit risk and think, this is how risky my loan book is. This is how many people I've got with this kind of credit score, which means this kind of bad rate. I think that's great for credit worthiness on the credit risk side. For affordability, one could also use um, open banking data on an aggregate basis to understand how affordable your loan portfolio is as well. Mm -hmm. So like in Nest Egg, we use um, the 50, 30, 20 budgeting rule. 50% of your money should go on needs, 30% on discretionary spend, and 20% paying down debt and saving for the future. If that's in balance, your loan is pretty much affordable. So if your loan portfolio is in balance, you know that you're doing pretty well in terms of meeting those FCA obligations around credit worthiness and affordability. So yes, it, it helps with thin credit profiles, but I think you know on an aggregate basis, it's really useful to understand the affordability risk of your overall loan portfolio too. Uh, Rob, if I can draw the same thing at you, where, where can we get this richness from assessment? Yeah, I mean, just to pick up on a point that Adrian made there, um, I mean, you know, our view is that open banking cannot and probably will not replace credit bureau information because let's be clear, there are two different sources of information there. One reveals information about your credit behaviour and the other reveals information about your income and your spend. So we've always maintained that the two are complementary and not competitive. And I think that's quite important um, to bear in mind. Um, the issue of assessment though is really interesting because I think the FCA has picked up on some of this now and started to realise the power that open banking data has around improving the quality of assessments that lenders can make because of the richness of data that is surfaced in the journey. Now, I think that's what's been quite interesting and we've seen, I think in the most recent research that we did, nearly 60% of lenders said that employed open banking results of the impact of COVID because of the richness of data that's being surfaced to enable them to better understand risk, which place the comment that Adrian just mentioned about firstly understanding risk across your portfolio and the overall level of exposure but then secondly taking it down to individual level and looking at how you can then use that to personalize your engagement with the individual based around a better understanding of actually what their their affordability is and it's now um, cascading into some what I call emerging credit lines and products such as buy now pay later where it's looking at what parts open banking could play in something like a pay now 
buy now pay later experience to better understand people's affordability so i think it's it's an emerging and evolving landscape certainly um so uh, the assessments is, is is really important the other key point that i touch upon is actually the role of automated categorization of bank transaction data because that's gone from a concept to people actually operationalizing it now and that that assesses that helps the assessment process because the speed and efficiency it brings to firstly processing large volumes of bank transaction data then the quality of the insight that you can get and the speed at which you can then make a decision and that's really important and what we're seeing now as a trend is that many institutions are looking to deploy open banking categorization operationally to do some of the things that lucky touched upon uh, previously about increasing efficiencies and improving the quality of the decision making process great answer carolyn if i could come to you and, and shape the question a little bit if that's okay you work with the journey and the customer experience of vulnerability and of assessment open banking is being used i think that's what the big thing we've got here 830 million apis this month how much has it changed the way that journey is done has it added richness to it expand and, and answer as widely as you wish for just a moment i'd like participants to put on customers shoes um and we're going to talk about bob he's um on his he's got his last five pounds in his pocket and he takes that to the bookies and he puts it on a horse that he's certain to win and he loses and he can't face going home and telling his wife that he's put that last five pounds on the bucket on the horse and he lost it and so he puts £10 on, he goes into a bit deeper into his overdraft, he puts £10 on an, on another horse. And this cycle repeats itself for the next half hour, 40 minutes, 50 minutes. And he loses and he goes home with a significant amount less than he walked in with, both in his pocket and in his bank account. When you go forward to taking an assessment, it requires full be, right, requires the participant to be open about their banking. And I have no doubt that the banking, that assessment experience where the customer says, yes, I open, I'm open to open banking, so allowing open banking to use my, uh, to, to use open banking to do my assessments, it's a better experience. But being honest, I think the words open and banking put off a lot of people yep. because they can't be open. They haven't told their wife that they've lost that money and that they've got this betting habit. They haven't told their parents. They haven't told their ch their children. And so there's certain things that they can be open about, the water bills, the energy bills, but there's certain things that they don't want to be open about. Yeah. So I think Very being true. open and banking is a big thing for people. And I, I I've seen it time and time again, where they say yes, the experience and the outcomes are better. But getting them to say yes is a big is a big matter of trust and how they talk about it. You know, they, they, it's a perception, and whether it's right or wrong, it's a perception about about the, what the, what's going to happen with that data and where it's going to be used and how it's going to be used. And I think there's a general lack of trust between vulnerable people and their um, the financial institutes that they um, work with at the moment, which doesn't help. You know, you're building on a bedrock of mistrust. So you've got to address that before we can address anything else. For the record, I, I violently agree with you. I think the, the fact that people have got to know what's going to be done with their data is so important. I, I avoid that issue of uh, how far people go with it. But D Dave, if I can bring you in here at this point as mm -hmm. well, there's an interesting point there. From the experience within uh, London Borough of uh, whichever one I won't name as well, you manage as well, <laughs> Would it have been a lot easier for you to get the client's information if open banking was there to get the consent for copies of bank statements for the relevant returns you made to manage their finances? Well, I'm trying to make it in the real world now. Would you have seen that as something that helps? It, it really would have been. The, the opportunity to, to go to somewhere and say, we have this client, here's his court protection order, tell me everything about this client financially would have been fantastic. And, and we still see that service we're still trying to run that service through finders for, for local authorities. So um, to have that opportunity there to find the information is so key to somebody that is that knows nothing about this person. I'll give you a case study, for example. Somebody goes into hospital. They have no background information. They're found on the street, wandering. They're taken into hospital. A social worker then places them into care and then says to the local team, can you manage their finances? Well, that person, they know nothing about. So to have... You know, they know their name, they possibly know their national insurance number, and they can then go and ask somebody to do that search and try and find that information for them. It really, really would solve uh, a lot of um, a lot of problems. There's a huge opportunity here for open banking to help and to support those vulnerable adults and those people that manage their finances. This is a real opportunity for something to be done, as well as 
you know, talking about the the issues of people and their their gambling habits and things like that. And you know, you you could find out more about that person, what they were, what they were previously before they lost capacity. Know their likes, their dislikes. Know what they used to do. It would give you so 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 much more information about that person. If I, I add to today's point. One of the things that working in that arena was it was as important to know what people hadn't spent as to know what they had spent because if they hadn't spent something was going wrong and it, we always concentrate on affordability and assessment as well but actually the lack of activity is that if i can pass to you lucky now that i suppose the question to you is as somebody with forty thousand customers and 40 percent of them using assessments and using it via uh, london mutual credit union as well how did you go about that how do you gain that trust within the client base to get them to share the data is it explain expand give me whatever answer you can Yes, Simon, it wasn't a big issue at all. Um, most of our members are kind of happy to take part on that journey because it's partly built into the, the loan application. So it's just a matter of um, clicking the button here and there. like So that, that's the one thing. But it's just the trust as well. I think most, most of our members trust us and they, they know we handle their data uh, appropriately. So that's another the reason why they are um, happily allowing us to use the data. And then how we use the data when we get it is another important part as well. And and when we pick up, for example, someone with uh, huge gambling habits. So we are not rejecting their loan uh, straight away, but we are giving them uh, a plan. Like we work with GamCare, for example, if someone have a gambling uh, a problem. So, and um, other agencies like, uh, debt reconciliation agencies, a step change, people like that. So we signpost them. And the, the good example is the gambling. So if, if you find someone gambling, uh, sometimes the half of their benefits, for example, uh, we signpost them, we ask them to work with the GamCare for three months, come back to us. So we will see uh, if there are any improvements. Uh, and then we allow them to have a loan. So it's just um, just a one-stop shop, like, and when we take the holistic approach. I mean, I, I, I applaud the comments. I think the big thing you said there for me that resonates is trust. It's banded around a great deal, but plus trust is built between buyer and seller, whatever the exchange is. And you can see that the trust between the credit union and the members is the reason making them doing it. To Carolyn's point, you know, you, you, you want to build that trust between them, and I do believe it comes from them. I'm, I'm going to jump a question because we can talk about solutions, which if people adopted them would help a great deal, but there's barriers. What are the barriers? Uh, now, Carolyn, if I can come to you, because I think this is probably one of the most important questions of the day. What's the fences we've got to jump? Sorry to give a horse racing analogy, probably not quite apt as well, but what are the fences we've got to jump? How do we get people to create more trust, have more confidence, have more faith? Well, actually, John Doyle in the comments have answered this question perfectly. So, uh, you know, it, it, the, the, the open banking can serve up and any other provider can serve up all of these great solutions but what they have to be there to do is solve a problem. And it has to be right. to solve a customer problem, not a business problem, but customer, if customer wins, business wins. And if business wins, the commercial, you know, the commercials and the colleagues are everybody's happier. So when we talk about the barriers, I think what we have, somebody posted something on LinkedIn this morning to say, how do we find a market for this? You know, this, this great innovative product. I don't think you find a market for a product if you develop your product from a need, from a solution, from a sorry, from a need or a problem, then it begins to to fit, and and that, that that's where you break break down the barriers. So, I have no doubt that open banking is a great tool. But we spoke about this again earlier in the chat that um, it's for organisations to build that into experiences that overcome customers problems and address needs and challenges i agree with you solve problems and you'll always have a place there's not much innovation uh, there's only yeah. problems to solve as well adrian uh, somebody that uh, runs these kind of things any views on the barriers i can certainly talk about the barrier from credit unions perspective but i i, I notice what's going on in the chat so i might just feel free words of, a caution as well around productivity so i think um for credit unions, it's always been a, the big barrier has always been around integration. So you've got this situation where open banking is built on open APIs, open application program interfaces, but credit union banking platforms tend to be very closed, both in their mindset, but also in their functionality. And what I would say is uh, don't let that stop you. 
And there are plenty of workarounds that you can do with open banking that don't require a full integration. That can come later. The longer you delay this journey, the more you're going to miss out. And our evidence suggests if you're using open banking alongside credit bureau information, you get about 20% more accepted loan applications at the end of the day. So it's definitely worth doing. Then I've kind of got two words of caution, really. One is addressing a question that came up in the chat. And that was around productivity. And I think what we found speaking to some credit unions, lots of fancy dashboards, lots of really interesting transactional data. It's taking longer to do loan assessments now. People get lost in all of this information. And I think a, a, a word of caution is definitely around keep it high level if you can. Don't get too lost into the transactions because you you can extend the time it takes you to assess a loan. And that leads to the second point. And I've heard it mentioned before and I've heard it mentioned a lot over the summer. And that's that open banking, I think, can lead to what you might call frequency illusion. Um, for the social scientists, it's known as the beta meinhof phenomenon. That's when you see something for the first time, you then think you see it lots of times after. And so naturally, a lot of open banking providers have, have prioritised the categorization of gambling transactions. And we heard over the summer how lots of credit unions said gambling has gone through the roof. Well, it didn't. Yeah, people change their gambling channel from the high street to online. But actually, overall, gambling didn't go up that much. And what about the hidden addictions? So as a nation, on average, we spend twice as much on sticky buns, cakes and biscuits than we do on gambling. But that's a hidden sugar addiction. And we ignore that. We don't see alcohol. We don't see drugs. We get focused on this gambling thing. How do we make sure that when we've got access to all of this information, that we try and we make sure we're aware about cognitive biases? We make sure that when we're assessing these loans and all this extra information, we don't become more judgmental and we kind of just keep it focused on the high, high level stuff. So barrier around integrations, ignore it, just crack on. Um, but when you do crack on, don't get lost in all of that detail because it can be a minefield that can actually reduce, not increase productivity. I mean, Rob, I've got I've got to bring you into this because you know you are you come from uh, the world of the enormous data lakes that are there as well. What barriers do you see that you, you mentioned before that the the two are complementary, which I agree with. I, I don't think there's a binary answer when it comes to people, but you know there's certainly a, a very high percentage of complementary there. What are the barriers that you see that getting the open banking data to be drawn in with the traditional CRD data? Any open views you've got? Yeah, I just go back to the point that Adrian made there, which is that um, I think some of the challenges we face with lenders sometimes is that the volume of data that potentially they can get access to, um, they don't always want it. There are probably a key set of variables that they want to focus on because the frame of reference basically is, well, this is how we've done it before. We recognize that this is a new source of data which potentially give, can give us access to more accurate information, more timely and accurate information. But actually, when you say, do I want three months or 12 months worth of transaction data, they always default to something like three months, because whilst 12 months might tell you more, the view is if you tell me more, then, you know, I have to do something with that because of the nature of the way, you know, consent and GDPR works. It's, it's an interesting balance because I'll give you an example. So um, take gig, what, what we refer to as gig economy workers. So people are on zero hours contracts or short term contracts. OK, if you share three months worth of bank transaction data for that particular individual, it might reveal that the three months they shared data, they had no job and therefore you mm -hmm. wouldn't give them access to credit. But if you can share 12 months of data, you can see actually, oh, Simon's actually a, um, a, a, a seasonal worker. He earns the majority of his income during the first nine months of the year. For the remaining three months, he doesn't work at all. Actually, I can afford to lend him, um, uh, lend him, give him credit on the basis of that. Gig economy workers are a forecast to make up 25% of our workforce over the next five years. So uh, a, there's an audience where open banking and the sharing of data and the richness of data would really help them to get access to financial services. And um, we might preclude them unless lenders start to think about how they change some of their policy rules and the data they consume. But I think, going back to the original point, some of the challenges around it's almost too much data and do I really need too much data? And there's nervousness around sharing too much data. So managing that problem is quite important, I think, for both the consumer and, and the lender. Very interesting. Dare I ask the elephant in the room question? 
is the problem getting underwriting to change its behaviours? If we just listen to Lucky before about assessing debt and, and waging on, is the problem the traditional and legacy business of credit underwriting and making those assessment decisions and getting them to change? Because we know we've got the data and we know we've got a different set of data. I mean, Rob, I, I'm going to apologise for my next comment. I think there is a place now for a bank account driven credit assessment. But for that to happen is exactly to your point, which is what data do those lenders want? I mean, as a, as a follow on to come back to you, I know that that would be an enormous step change for most mainline lenders to change their credit assessment wholesome. That day's a long way away, surely. Did you agree? Or I absolutely agree. So, again, I just want to go back to this point. You know, when you look at let's let's firstly divorce the credit score, which is what people come refer to, to the underlying credit information. OK, open banking will not reveal the level of data that you get within the bureau about people's credit behavior. So that's the first point. But to your to your point, though, we are seeing an evolution starting to take hold now around how we can improve credit scores using other sources of data or adding to your credit score against some of the information such as you know, data sources like open banking offering to the market. But you're absolutely right. The challenge with that, because a lot of this is hardwired into lenders, is how do you then flex your credit policies to reflect that? Innovative, we've got, we've got a, a cross-section of innovative, innovative lenders that are starting to do that. Fintechs are leading some of this, but even some of the more established institutions, I know at least one or two, are starting to use open banking in a more agitative way to kind of flex their credit policies because they see the benefits of them. So for things like manual referrals, you know, where you've got to take them down a process whereby, which is more long-winded, if you can use open banking data to automate that process because the quality of insight it gives you, that speeds up the experience of both you and the customer, um, but also helps safeguard them as well. So I think you're right. I think we're set on a train now whereby lenders are going to start to firstly recognize the value of data and see how it can augment existing data to start enhance the the decisioning process. And that may see a, a gradual evolution in terms of credit scores, which should incorporate third party data. I'm going to jump a question, if you don't mind, as well. I think it's an important one to address. We, we listened to Lucky earlier, who talking directly to his customers. He's embedded open banking. Carolyn's working with large organizations. Dave's um, working there to get probate. Obviously, John, Rob, your customer base is enormous as well. How do we change the mindset of the large population owners? Not so much just the banks, the energy companies, so we can get rid of poverty tariffs. How do we get better information to local authorities? Ginny, Genevieve just asked a question mm. on the chat about how do we stop inclusion before it happens. Visibility is the key to a great deal of these things. Cash flow is king. If we can see where people are cash-wise, we know an awful lot. Carolyn, how do we get industry to embrace open banking to potentially not help them financially, but to help a great deal of their customers financially well we and we see it would help them financially both customers mm. and businesses but i think ultimately this comes down to one of two avenues um it's where the people connect emotionally with the need maybe they've yeah. seen it heard stories in their own customer base or their friends and family and if they don't connect emotionally then it's the risk-based uh, factor it's you know it's am i at risk of being um fined am i compliant with regulations um, am I uh, other things going on that I don't know about? You know, we see so many fine, regulatory fines these days that are for things that people that the you know the senior leaders weren't aware of was going on or purported to not be aware of. Um, so it's, it's it's connect emotionally with it or connect on a risk basis, and then when you do that, when you see the the factors that are coming to play and actually the real experiences that people are, are, are facing then you can begin to look for solutions. And I think open, blank, open banking is a big springboard in, the, in many of those problems. If you were to journey map your customer's experience, you will be able to visibly look at hotspots on that journey map and say, open banking could help there, open banking could help there. And it will be a gradual thing. It's not like, you know, you hear people say digital first and you might want to be open banking first, but let's just go for better, not best, because best seems too far away sometimes. Better is more achievable. Lucky, over to you. How do we get industry to open up to do some of the things that you've done in anger? How do we get them to embrace some of the flexibility open banking is going to give them for their vulnerable customers? I think um, what Caroline said as well, but coupled with that, um, I would uh, kind of, hit heavily on publication of case studies uh, with uh, some good statistics to show that 
how they uh, how the open banking can save money for the corporations like some Siemens and HMRC. Uh, how can they work efficiently? And once they understand that, uh, I think they will automatically will think, oh, why didn't I think that before? Kind of thing. So uh, the good case studies and uh, facts and figures. Dave, you work with these organizations that you need to get data from. How do you get them to engage? How do we get them to real? I mean, can I just qualify this? I'm the person that works in open banking with HMRC. So we've got a bunch of work going on. It's been unbelievable to sit there and say that a sovereign government is one of the fastest in market. Some of the plans they've got for tax regimes, heads of duty, salaries, benefits are just staggering. But it's a precedent, isn't it? But I know what I can do in my little world, but I have a fantastic brand behind me of the, the first standards body for open banking in the world. I've got a massive advantage. The biggest thing for me is, is convincing that sweet C-suite, the boardroom, to understand it, to actually get what this is and how it isn't a threat to them, it is an advantage to them as well. Dave, what would you do? What's the magic wand to get industry to embrace it? Good question, Simon. Do you know what? I haven't got a clue how we would do it. Uh, it, it you know, it, it's, it, it's such a... Um, a difficult thing to cross when somebody say loses capacity or something like along those lines or somebody passes away and what their responsibilities are. I, I don't, it's a scary proposition. I spoke to a lawyer this morning, okay, and about this, said I'm coming on this webinar and give me some feedback about what you think about banks. And a lot of it was about traditional banking. And, and that's, I think one of the sticking points is traditional banking needs to move forward and needs to embrace the new technology that's there with with what you've got with open banking um you know there's no hard set rules at all out there about what people can and cannot do so does there need to be some statutory guidance from government mm. about what they should do you know the say we we you know when we're a deputy or a, a acting under a lasting power of attorney you're acting under the mental capacity act yeah. and there are rules of the mental capacity acts as how you're supposed to do you're supposed to behave and there are five key principles and one of those principles is to treat people as though they have capacity do they treat people that have capacity i have examples where clients of mine were denied um you know had to have a you know a, a prepaid meter but they could afford to pay a direct debit every month, but they weren't able to because they were seen as being vulnerable. So it's education, I think. Yeah, coming back to it, it's education. That's what we've got to do. We've got to educate everybody to the terms of vulnerability. It doesn't mean to say that you're not capable of having something like open banking, having access to a bank account, having access to a non-prepaid meter, a direct debit. And you know the work that say look is doing with 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 the the credit union and, and opening things up that is the way forward so if that could be rolled out nationally fantastic I'm going to jump across slightly sideways here now we've talked about assessment a great deal i think we should touch on the payments market and, and how that works because obviously without a payment there is no balance and without a payment there is no assessment adrian how far away are we from a non-risk very low risk payment instrument i'll rephrase that at the moment a lot of the data we rely on for categorization is card driven because the data within cards is so much richer than the bank payment data. It, 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 it fundamentally is by its nature. How far are we away from the prepay meter that Dave just talked about? They can pay it by their phone automatically. We know that Siemens have done it. We know that it's coming along. Where do we go, Adrian? What's there from payment without card, account-based credit score, no poverty tariffs? Sorry, that's a difficult question. I think one of the big issues to address, though, um, just to answer part of that question and then maybe see if there's some more expertise on the panel is around the fact that um, with people facing financial exclusion, so much of their payment methodology is already pretty patchy. Yeah. So what we see on the open banking data very often yeah. is um, if we see it at all, we see a lot of people cash in, cash out um, and it's cash spend. It's very difficult. Um, and, uh, there are a number of reasons for that around trust, around getting hold of the money before direct debits come out because you, you need you need to put food on the table before you pay the gas or electricity. So that can be quite patchy. Um, and the other big thing we see on open banking data is transactions between different accounts where it makes it very difficult to understand income. So I think there's a long way to go when a lot of financially excluded individuals are still living a cash economy for a variety of extraordinarily good reasons, and we wouldn't necessarily want to remove those. And also, um, 
the kind of more um, sort of left field or off the radar lenders who would never accept these kind of payments. But I think it's a huge opportunity, especially when we look at things like the, you know, the around the poverty premium and how much more it costs to be poor. And I think what we need, going back to Lucky's point earlier and points that people have made, is good, solid, effective case studies to demonstrate to large institutions that this can work and have a direct benefit on their vulnerable customers. I'm not going to ask you the question about a bank account against credit score. I hope you don't mind. I don't want to throw you under that bus. Um, lucky um what what difference can open banking make in that respect do you think it, you can see a a new dawn for your customers new ways of servicing their bank account new ways of getting data in get them away from that cash society we're coming up to the difficult question next any views yeah definitely simon i think uh, our, our members are benefiting already like uh, faster payments for example uh, we are switching away from legacy back payment type things uh, that members has to wait three days to get their money and now within a few minutes that they will get their money if they transfer it from one account to the other so that kind of thing is going to help uh, financially excluded or included people so that, that's the one thing but uh, and then giving different services um, this kind of services for the financially excluded people will uh, also put them into a different uh, perspective like you know they, they really like to use this kind of services and then they like to save money we all think that oh people are financially excluded they don't have money to save no the, the you need to see how how much our members are saving and building up their savings like even two three pounds a week um it's just facilitating uh, that kind of products and services so uh, open banking for us is uh, next best thing happened after the size of bread, like, you know, we are, and as an organization, we are saving a lot of money, uh, switching off from legacy systems to uh, the new technology, API-based technology. Mm -hmm. And of course, as a credit union, then we will pass those benefits. If you make profits, we share with the, the, the members. And, and um, that money we also use to improve our services. So right now we are looking into making use of uh, open banking, credit bureau data, put them all together and coming up with uh, the machine language uh, kind of things to help us to uh, further improve our loan assessment process. Yes, so it's going to help us uh, in years to come, I think. I'm going to move on now to the elephant in the room. Jim Purves has just put a, a, a note in there about that the, the discussion is incorrect. I did explain at the start that financial inclusion covers many areas, but the largest one, the hardest one without any doubt, is the unbanked. Now, whether or not they have a bank account is one conversation. Uh, whether or not they have a, a post poker account, which I'm very familiar with as well. For the record, I personally think the poker account is the solution to uh, full financial inclusion to allow people to make payments from a poker account using open banking, which they could, um, and just make one deposit from it to stop the cash. We know that companies like PayPoint or Pay, um, PayZone, uh, they, they operate all the cash payments in here. So the hardest question to the panel, what do we do about the people with no bank account? How do we get them? Adrian, you touched upon it earlier. I hope you don't mind if I come back to you first, sir. Sure. So I think, you know, because I think financial exclusion, the first time I heard it was sort of late 90s. And yeah. Typically, it, it encompasses four things. So um, access to a transactional bank account is one, but also a lack of access to credit savings and insurance are the other. And I'm sure we're all aware of loads of really great case studies, some of which we're hearing here about how open banking improves access to credit can certainly help people improve their um, record of savings. And I've seen a lot of good stuff going on in the insurance marketplace as well. And so I just go back to this idea really around and it, it's slightly left field to open banking, but it just it always amazes me that I spend ages getting all my ID and everything together in order to access one service in one provider. I just can't chunk that up into some mm. token of some description and just go give it to someone else and then I access those services. So I think the solution to so yeah, you, you can't really be using open banking until you've got that transactional account. But look at all this great opportunity there is to really help people out. We've got loads of evidence on the panel and no doubt in the audience how really effective this can be to reduce the poverty premium and help people budget better, help people access more money. But to me, the secret just lies in I've made all the effort to get, you know, for example, 
an account with this provider, can I just not use that evidence to open an account somewhere else? The portability, the kind of decentralized approach to identification of which open banking, of course, provides a, could provide a key component to that. And also, you know, it may be from my experience and, I've, you know, when assessing loan applications over the years, someone might not have a mainstream bank account, but there's usually some way of getting electronic transfers into some form of account. So there's, there's yeah. usually seem to be something to work with. And maybe we can use that to leverage a more effective um, current account. But it probably goes back to your whole point about convincing some of the big players about why um, enabling access is good, good for their business and, and, and good for their customers. Dave, uh, as somebody that's probably managed quite a few people with no bank account, uh, yeah. I'll be very interested in your thoughts, but how do we fix it? Well, it's interesting that the post office card account comes up because that was the bane of my life for many, many years. Um, trying to get information out of the various people that uh, juggled that account. It went from one provider to another provider to another provider. I, I think it's gone now, isn't it? Uh, they were trying to get rid of it, but, uh, <laughs> but there we are. Yeah, um, exactly that point. One place that you can put the information that everybody feeds into, whether you've got a lasting power of attorney, a court protection order, you're an appointee, or it's a probate issue, you can go to that place and that then open banking then feeds out to the various institutions to find those very things. So, yeah, that's that's how we open it up. Um, vulnerable vulnerable adults you know can still spend cash can still want to save cash, as we said, you know, they should still have the opportunities there ready and open for them and, and there is a great opportunity here for it to be done but as i said the, the, there are so many obstructions in place from the legacy banks let's say and, and, and the things that they've done over the years um that it's going to be very difficult but whoever cracks it fantastic and um i'd love to work with them let's say to try and get this get this out there carolyn yeah, so I'm going to come back to needs again. So you know, stick. I want to stick with um, Jim's point around the around the unbanked, and I, I think to to lump them into one group is probably wrong because yeah. admittedly you have to at the start, but um, break them down into their needs because there will be a portion of those who want to be banked but can't for a, for a variety of reasons, and then there'll be those that just don't want to. And you know, we need it inclusive solutions for both so we can't be in a position where we're um favoring one just because they get us nearer to our corporate goals you know we need to make sure that we're coming from this from the right moral position and by doing so we'll address needs we'll we'll begin to excel we'll get a better reputation as an industry and we'll move into a position where we can where more people will intuitively trust open banking so i think understand the needs of those unbanked map their journeys look at where open banking can help those that want to be banked and then look at the unbanked experience and see if there's any place for open banking in that or indeed if that's a another uh service in itself can i pass to you rob yeah thanks i mean i don't really know what to say i could add after that to be honest with you because i think they've all been really good points that just to pick up on, on caroline's point though i think You've got to respect there is a proportion of customers that for whatever reasons want to live a cash-based life, and that's fine. But I, I do wonder if both the, the combination of government and, and the big banks could do more to work collaboratively to help solve the problem. Because Carolyn's right in the sense that there is definitely a cohort of consumers out there that probably would like to be banked. But it's just helping them understand exactly what the benefits of being banked are. And let's also acknowledge that probably the vast majority of these people do live their lives on a mobile phone. So it's, it's not necessarily about digital exclusion. It's about understanding the benefits of having an account and making it easy to be able to access and manage your money in that account. And there's got to be a, a role for kind of government in terms of promoting the benefits of a basic bank account, along with the big banks, to solve that problem. And, you know, there's got to be an incentive there surely for the banks because it means you can acquire more customers okay they might not be the your most profitable customers admittedly but there's a service there that potentially um you could provide i think the elephant in the room also uh, and that might be coming which we should not forget is you know banks looking at the role of, of of charging for current account services and i think that's something we need to be very careful about because that might drive people in the other direction if we're not careful. Um, so I think there's balances and checks to be put in, but there's got to be a role for government and the big players in the market, or let's, you know, the challenger banks to work collaboratively to solve this problem. But acknowledge that there are people that are always going to want to live a cash-based cash -based life. Thank you very much. Lucky, final answer of the day, I leave it to you, on banks. Yeah, I think, uh, as Adrian mentioned, the, the financial inclusion 
the world started, I think, back in 1990s, and uh, one of the things was underbanked. Uh, but I think we have moved a long way from that. Um, so it is kind of going from unbanked to underbanked, like So yeah. the, the government kind of forced them, forced most of the banks to open the basic bank account. And they did that to a certain extent. But, so the statistics gone down, yep. but the, the, the product that they offer is not enough now for them to do proper banking. So they, they have a card just to withdraw the money from the ATM. So they can't shop around and buy uh, the best products from the online. Um, no, no good, um, sorry, the online banking and things are excluded, some of the banks. So it's just a moving away from uh, unbanked to underbanked. And, and then, of course, the banks need to come up with different things. But all the new fintech banks coming are kind of filling that gap as well so that's another good thing happened uh, as part of the open banking as part of the government intervention uh, to bring the banking into uh, the new era kind of thing i think the big thing we say there is we need ubiquity uh, we need to get people in as well we are running really close to time can i first of all thank the panelists for joining us uh, i appreciate your views your time and your indulgence a great deal and I know how important your time is um, to share it with us. Great. Can I thank everybody for attending? And I hope that you've picked up there. There's a pretty key message, which is we can't fix it in, in completion. We've got, we've got to knock this into little steps and go and take it. The other thing I hope you've taken away is there's a lot of it going on. Uh, you've just heard from people using open banking today on the panel, the values it can bring, the help it can give. But with that, I close the session. Thank you very much for attending uh, Tech UK. And I'll be glad you're here. And thank you very much and see you soon. Thanks, folks.